one can't talk about the president without thinking and talking about Mrs. Johnson. She was then and remains such a gracious person and a very much a, an influential person in her own right. She's the expert on President Johnson. I don't accept anybody else's expertise on the president. I do accept hers. She was a thoughtful one in addition to him, and he was, he was thoughtful, as I've said. They would enter, she and the president would kind of on the spur of the moment sometimes want to have people down to dinner from the hill. I think it was on a Saturday that Mrs. Johnson, or maybe Miss Abel, called for her. They need to have certain members of Congress down, want to have some for dinner tonight. Get a son. Well, okay. So I suggested, among others, uh, a Congressman Andrews from, I think it was North Dakota. I said he hasn't been there and he would appreciate it. I would be thinking he's in town. Well, it turned out somewhere along the line, certainly one the President of Ms. Johnson's fault, they got Congressman Andrews from Alabama, who had never supported the President on anything if he could possibly help it. <laughs> and Congressman Andrews came down there and I heard later on from the President, what is he doing here? And Congressman Andrews went back to the Hill and said, what was I doing there? So I, I'm glad I won at that occasion. But um, I caught my share of the credit and blame, whatever you want to call it about it. Ms. Johnson is, I don't know what, what all one can say in terms of superlatives that would not apply to Mrs. Johnson. She, what she did on highway beautification, of course, is well known. But what she did, she was an early, one of the early ones in the environmental field, if you recall. She took some trips, I think with Udall, who was Secretary of the Interior. She talked about it. That was before the environment really got to be, well, fashion was not quite the right word, but uh, before the environment really came to the public consciousness. And uh, right after the Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And Ms. Johnson got out, I would say, kind of pioneered that into the public consciousness. I think it was because of the efforts that she began that later on, after we left, really, I believe it was when we got the Environmental Protection Agency. But she uh, had a lot to do with that just by dint of her efforts. And of course, highway beautification, we were due on, and the president really worked on that one. I wasn't there at the time, but I heard about it later on. And uh, he made it be known we got to do this for Lady Bird. He went at the leadership because I had the leadership mentioned to me. Well, he wants this just like he did the highway beautification. I think they said one of them said something like that. And uh, she was a great influence and a very, very constructive influence. And people, the members, and a lot of the members knew Mrs. Johnson from her long residence in Washington or they met her, and I never found a person who didn't admire her. And those who knew her really loved her, and still do, still do. She was an, she was an adornment to, watch, to the Washington scene, and made a contribution all in her own way, independently. What were what was um, what were you proudest of LBJ for? Well, I was proudest of him for the civil rights legislation. <clears throat> Voting rights is the first thing I worked on when I came to justice. Congressman Seller was chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and he, even though I was new, he let me, as being from justice, sit in on that markup of that legislation. It was a great thing. It still is a great thing. And of course, it couldn't have been accomplished without Johnson. It really couldn't have been. The House, we had friends there. We had to have a bipartisan. I got Congressman McCullough from Ohio, Rankin Republican. He helped. And then you get over to the Senate, and of course you had the intransigent Southerners who for reasons which were understandable were not going to be for that. Russell was one of them. He was an old friend of Johnson's. 
It must have been hard for both of them to get past that. I'm not sure that they ever did. They had some problems later on, as you know. It was Johnson's influence, his personal influence, with Dirksen. Sometimes exercised through Katzenbach, but more often directly, that got it done in the Senate. Plus using Humphrey to break the filibuster in 64 on the original civil rights legislation. And then on 65, remember now who the players were, except it's still us, from the White House. House was still the same. And uh, to me, that was, that was the big thing among a bunch of really big things. You go through, you know, what was done in education, the start we made in the environment. We used to run that list. I know you're familiar with it. I haven't looked at it. I need to go refresh myself someday on all the things that were passed. The thing about Johnson, not the thing, but a thing, he was long on charm, but he was also long on vision. I think he really, really wanted to do something and leave something that was worthwhile, and he did. It's sort of like the concluding remarks of his farewell address when he went up to the Congress that evening. He said, a hundred years from now, they'll say we tried. And we did. Wouldn't have been done without him and Ms. Johnson. So what else? Talk about the war a little bit. Uh, you obviously were had to had to factor that into your relationship with the members of Congress. Well, on the House side, which is where I mainly was occupied, Manitas, as you know, was on the Senate side. I think the way was a little harder for him because Mansfield did not like the White House lobby and the senators. I don't think he was mean about it, but he did not. It didn't make the way any easier for Mike, so what, Mike Manitas, so I think what he had to do, he kind of had to see through Mansfield what was going on rather than making the direct contact. I never talked to Manitas directly about that, but I got that idea. On the House side, there was not that much opposition to Vietnam. Uh, the President was always interested in the reactions of members of Congress. So after a recess, we would try to check the members as to what they found out at home, what was on people's minds. Didn't ask what were people saying about Vietnam, but what, what did they say? And um, I'd ask other folks to do that with me because it said a lot what was on their minds. It said, well, in my home, we've been worried about the county fair and not getting our federal subsidy. Well, that meant that they weren't occupied with Vietnam. So on the House side, you knew where the opposition was, but it did not seem to me to interrupt the flow of domestic legislation. It was hard enough to get it passed anyway, but I didn't think that Vietnam entered into it. So I didn't have to leap to the defense, and the president was kind of his own best defender about that. What happened to home rule? We got it, didn't we? No. I thought we got it and had Walter Washington installed as mayor. We got, we got, the, like, we got the hmm? appointed mayor or something, but Johnson uh, always said he knew that that was the end of the road when, when they lost the home road. Whatever we got, we got more form than they had had. I remember that. I remember Walter Washington being installed. It was not an election, though, at that time. So I guess we just kind of got it started. It was not the end of the road as it turned out. I should have got my list out before I was getting myself ready to answer that question. I haven't looked at it for a long time. Well, Barefoot, this has been great. Well, you're mighty patient. You you're mighty patient. A, a great addition to the archives. And with the, a lot of these days, you ask, what are we going to do with this? Uh, you know, we're, we're spending a fortune on this, and uh, we're going to have find some more money to just to get all this edited. We haven't transcribed it. Uh, James hasn't had, had time to edit any of it. Uh, 
because he's doing this in addition to his 